Okay, so um, in the webinar today, we're going to discuss health hazards in the workplace, and then we're going to go through the occupational hygiene cycle and how we use that to uh, assess and then minimise exposure to those health hazards in the workplace. I want to start with a poll, first of all. And I want that, that poll will be on how to, on what hazards you have on site. Just bring that up. Okay, there we go. So that poll is launched. Please take the time to fill that in. So these aren't all of the sites that you can, uh, all of the hazards that you can have on site, but they are some of the common ones that we see out there. So it'd be great to get your feedback on what you have on site. So we've got noise, which is a common one in a lot of industries. And I can see some of those coming through now. Uh, dust is another very common one and quite topical at the moment, particularly with accelerated silicosis. I can see a few of you have also got solvents exposure, so that can be uh, cleaning fluids, paints, um, and inks, and th those sorts of things. Carcinogens is, is another, another biggie, and I've even got someone saying they've got vibration hazards on site, which is something that I think is a nation we need to focus a bit more on. So lots of varied hazards there, which is great. I'll just share those results with you so you can have a look. Um, you can see noise and solvents um, are at the top there, followed closely by dust and other carcinogens. Just close that down. Okay, so these are the health hazards that we, uh, we assess when we're on site, and they can be broken down into physical, biological, and chemical, which are the ones that um, us occupational hygienists predominantly assess. There are also ergonomic and psychosocial hazards, which, are te which tend to be assessed by um, other groups, such as the Human Factors um, and Ergonomist Society, um, and they can also be broken down into uh, short-term and long-term effects, such and, and they're also called acute and chronic. So what do we see out there? We see such a range of, of worker health hazards in a range of at a range of industrial sites. We go to small workplaces where they might just have a few staff undertaking a, a small process right through to large industrial sites such as MDF manufacturing facilities, timber processing plants and engineering sites. So we see uh, a lot of noise out there and we also see um, solvent exposure from printing presses um, and animal feed mills as well where minerals and heavy metals can also play a part in exposures. So we know that these health hazards exist and why, but why do we have to manage these? And apart from it being the right thing to do, there are laws and regulations that relate to this. So the overarching health and safety uh, law is the Health and Safety at Work Act. And the, uh, main has, the main regulation that we look at is the uh, Re Regulation 36, the primary duty of care. And that states that the PCBU must ensure the health and safety as worker, of workers as far as reasonably practicable. Now, out of that Health and Safety at Work Act come a lot of regulations. And my personal favourite is the Health and Safety at Work General Risk and Workplace Management Regulations, or GRIM for short. Now, these regulations talk about identifying and managing hazards. They say that the uh, PCBU needs to identify all of their hazards and that they need to control them using the hierarchy of control measures. So that hierarchy is elimination if possible, or uh, if not possible, then minimization. And that minimization has its own hierarchy, uh, which includes uh, substitution, isolation, engineering, administration, and lastly, personal protective equipment to control hazards. There's also uh, Regulation 8, which is a duty to review the control measures. 
So once the control measures are established, that's all fine and good, but you need to make sure that they continue to work effectively to minimize exposure. And this is important because as uh, processes uh, are, are used, there's wear and tear, and if correct maintenance and review of those processes is not undertaken, they can increase health exposures to the people that are using them. There, then we will start to also talk about exposure monitoring. So for me as an occupational hygienist, it's great to see exposure monitoring mentioned in regulations because prior to HESWA, it wasn't. So Regulation 30 uh, talks about when exposure monitoring is required. And it basically says that if you're not sure that the exposure standards, such as the workplace exposure standards, are being met, then you should do exposure monitoring. In Regulation 32, it says that that exposure monitoring needs to occur at appropriate intervals, so it's not just a one-off thing, and it needs to be undertaken by a competent person. So in the, within the regulations, we're starting to see the occupational hygiene cycle emerging in some of that language. And I'll go through the occupational hygiene cycle with you all in a minute. So you know you've got health hazards on your site. What should you now do? Well, you need to make sure you identify all of those health hazards and they can be varied and they can result from processes um, that occur on site as well as from hazardous substances that are brought onto site. You need to be able to risk assess your hazards. If you're not sure how to risk assess your health hazards, then you can talk to someone like an occupational hygienist and we can help you with that task. If you're not sure how to identify all of your health hazards, then again, you can talk to someone like myself and, and my team on how to do that. But just like safety, the key step is to identify those health hazards and work out how, um, how much of a risk they pose to your team. If you notice that the health hazards are high and you're confident that those exposure standards are being exceeded, then you can go straight to control you can start to put in some control measures to reduce those exposures. You don't need to do exposure monitoring for everything. Now I want to talk about the occupational hygiene cycle. You'll see this, um, cycle, this I'm sure the cycle will be very familiar to, to some of you because it's a cycle of continuous improvement, such as we see in ISO 45001. So here it is, we've got anticipation, and that is where we uh, anticipate what hazards might be brought into the workplace from new processes or new substances that are brought onto site. Recognition is identifying the health hazards that are currently present and assessing the level of risk that they pose. From there, we move into evaluation, and this is where we can start using um, some scientific techniques such as exposure monitoring to assess the, the actual risk of the hazard. This is where we get to do lots of science, which is great. From there, we look at that data and we're comparing to exposure standards and we can determine if control is needed and what type of controls are needed. So did the exposure monitoring show that the hazard is well controlled, in which case, uh, we can just move it on to reassessment at a later date? Or did it show that the hazard needs to be further controlled to reduce exposure? What controls can be put in place to reduce exposure if needed? Uh, is, maybe PPE is the only control that's used, but there might be other controls that are further up the hierarchy that we can use to better control the hazard. We'll move on to another poll, and I want to get your views on what health and safety pro professionals you've used on site. Have you heard of um, an occupational hygienist before? Because we often um, aren't known. We're starting to get our name out there, which is really exciting. So I'm just launching the poll now. So on, on the poll, we've got uh, occupational hygienists, of course, 
uh, occupational health nurses, health and safety generalists, ergonomists, occupational physicians, or perhaps you haven't brought anyone into your workplace. All right, so, oh, a few people that have used occupational hygienists, that's great. And occupational health nurses too, which are another very important part of the, uh, of the health and safety team that you can bring into your business. So that's great. We've even got some people that have used ergonomists and occupational physicians, which are also play a really important role and don't have any responses that have put zero. So that's really great to see. I'll just share those results with you so you can have a look. So we've got occupational hygienists at the top there um, with occupational health nurses, which is very exciting. Okay, I just close that down. And we'll move on with the presentation. So I just want to go through each step of the occupational hygiene cycle in a bit more detail. So that first step of uh, put together anticipation and recognition, because they're both about identifying hazards. And this is where we use qualitative assessment techniques. So that's non-measurement techniques to assess uh, the health risk to, to the working, working group. So we can do this in a number of ways. We can do a full qualitative assessment, which involves looking at all health hazards on site, uh, risk assessing them for the entire, entire site, which is the more robust, most robust way of looking at identifying your health hazards. Often we um, are just doing a scoping visit. So that might be, we're looking at one particular health hazard or one particular area of the business, but not looking outside that. And from there, we can do a basic characterization of the health hazards. We look at a lot of uh, different aspects when we're on site. And we ask a lot of questions. So we look, ask you for your safety data sheets for your hazardous substances that you're using. We look at the process. Is there noise being generated? Is there vibration? We even look at what sort of lighting is, is present because lighting can have uh, detrimental health effects also. Then we look at how often people are exposed to the, to the health hazard. Is it all day, every day, or is it just during a cleaning task? Then from there, we can estimate the exposure based on the information we've gathered and our professional expertise. We can also start to determine our seeds. So that's similar exposure groups. In similar exposure groups, a group of workers that are exposed to similar health hazards and do a similar task. And that helps us group people together to work out what controls are needed for that group and helps us also when we're developing our exposure monitoring strategy. The next step is evaluation. So this, the evaluation step is undertaken where we're not sure if the exposure standards are being exceeded. As I said before, if you are confident that your exposure standards are being exceeded, go straight to control. Put some controls in place to get those exposure hazards minimized as much as you can, and then go back to evaluation and see if they are effective enough. Similarly, if the uh, qualitative assessment shows that your hazard is of insignificant risk and it, the hygienist is confident, that the exposure standards are not being um, exceeded, then you don't need to do evaluation. You can just put that on a reassessment cycle to continue to look at that, but not to do exposure monitoring. So evaluation or measurement um, can include undertaking personal exposure monitoring or biological monitoring or a combination of the two. So exposure monitoring is where we put uh, sampling equipment on operators and we use uh, the SEGS to determine which operators we want to measure and for what substances. And we measure their exposure over a full work shift or a task, depending on what the nature of the exposure has hazard is and how they work. Now, the, um, the equipment that is worn is often a, an air sampling pump that sits on, on the belt and a sampling head that sits on the lapel up by their breathing zone. 
And we sample by drawing air through a filter or a sorbent tube, and then we analyze the filter and sorbent tube for the particular hazard that we're looking at. There's a lot of science that goes into this part of the exposure monitoring, um, and we've got to get it right. So it's, it's a really important step and a quite a technical one at that. From there, we send the results to, an, to a laboratory, and then we look at those results that come through, compare the results to the workplace exposure standards or similar guideline, and then we make a determination as to the health hazard uh, that that substance or um, to that substance that that substance poses. From there, we can look at what controls are needed. So this evaluation step is uh, really important and really key for driving the next steps. During evaluation, we also undertake a lot of observations. Uh, we uh, like watching the process and seeing how different people uh, do the work because uh, some people, uh, because people work differently and that can be a control in itself. Training, making sure people have the right training to be able to do the work in the, in the best way to minimize exposure. We look at things like what current controls are in place and are they effective? Is the ventilation drawing fume away from the operator or is it drawing fume straight past the operator's breathing zone? Are the gloves suitable for the type of solvent that are being used or do they get, um, or do they permeate through the glove and they need a different type? We also look at what SOPs are in place and whether they're being followed or not. Uh, often we see SOPs put in place which have really robust uh, procedures, but for one reason or another, they're not being followed on site, which can create an exposure hazard. And that might be a training issue, or it might be that the SOP isn't practical for the task at hand. We also look at how long the, um, the operators work in their workplace. So, uh, the workplace exposure standards are based on an eight-hour uh, work shift. If people work longer than that, then we need to do a calculation to that exposure standard to take into account their longer exposure and their reduced rest time. We also look at what other processes are nearby and how they can affect the exposure profile of the uh, workers um, doing a particular tasks. So that we're doing lots of exposure observations and this is super critical to us being able to understand what controls need to be put in place um, if, the, if the monitoring data shows that that is needed. The third step is control. So I would like um, to do another poll and just ask you about what control measures you have on site. And I've got some. Um, basic ones up there, but I'm sure there are other um, controls you have on site as well. So there we go, we've got general ventilation. Uh, so that's like roof vents or maybe some roller doors that are open. That local exhaust ventilation, where you might have a capture hood at a, at a source, um, such as you know, during welding or on a process bath. Barriers to just keep people away from a process, that's a good isolation control. Signage, of course, um, which is an administrative control. Got PPE, which is very common out there, but remember lowest on our hierarchy. SOPs, another administrative control. Training, another administrative control. So getting some good responses there, looks like everyone has signage, which is great to see. Uh, it's a good good visual cue for people, and we've also got uh, PPE, which is a very another very common one, and training, of course. So I'll just end that poll now, and share those results. So signage was top there with a hundred percent of people having signage, no surprises there. But we've also got um, a lot of people with general ventilation and local exhaust ventilation too. I'll just close that down and back we go. So controls, what sort of controls can be put in place? So from the exposure monitoring, you'll get a report that outlines the level of risks on site, what we did, how we did it, 
and what you need to do next. We suggest control measures and we'll uh, rank those in following the control hierarchy. So our first um, control, our first cap off the ranks from the control hierarchy is elimination. Can you remove that hazard from the process? Now, this isn't always possible, and quite often it isn't, unfortunately. But it's important that you have, that you do think about that. For example, can you stop using a solvent for cleaning nozzles and use disposable nozzles instead? Now, that can also you know, have some issues around sustainability, but it's something that needs to be considered. The next one is substitution. Can you use a different product with a lower hazard? No point changing it for a higher hazard substance. But can you use a water-based solvent instead of a, an aromatic hydrocarbon-based solvent or an oil-based solvent? Um, can you uh, use? Can you remove the need for engineering uh, engineered stone bench tops and use only granite, for example? The next one is um, isolation. Can you move the process from the main workshop to the, the rear of the workshop where there's less people? Can you switch to automation and remove uh, the operator from the process entirely? Can you uh, use a quiet room for grinding and, and those sorts of things? So it's about minimizing how many people are exposed to the substance. Then we can start to look at engineering controls, and this could be general ventilation or local exhaust ventilation. For example, could you put a get one of the um, Plymo vent type style um, local exhaust ventilations to uh, remove welding fume during a process? Now, but when you're introducing that kind of control, you need to have some really robust training with it because the operator needs to be able to move the um, the capture hood to make sure that it is drawing fume away from the operator. They might need to move it as they um, continue on the welding process. So when you introduce controls like these, you need to have a think about what else you need to do to make sure that control is effective. We've also got administration, and we've seen some of those on the poll. So training is an administration control, SOPs, um, maybe job rotation so that people aren't exposed to the um, particular hazard for the full working week, maybe just one or two days of that week. And PPE, of course. So we've got a uh, uh, PPE man there with his uh, hard hat and hearing protection, respirators, um, overalls, which is something that we see um, aren't used effectively. So different overalls have different permeability for different chemicals. So it's important to gain an understanding of what your overalls are protecting from and whether they can protect against that substance. And there's some great resources out there to be able to do that. The same for gloves. We have seen before that a solvent has been used um, and people have been using nitrile gloves because uh, there's a common misconception that nitrile is better than latex. But then as soon as the um, particular solvent uh, touches those or they use it for a period, the glove just starts to disintegrate. So it's important that the right type of glove is used for the right type of solvent. I'm going to move on to a case study now. So you can see how we use this occupational hygiene cycle in, in, in the field. Um, give you a, a bit more insight into it. So we're going to look at a company that manufactures uh, engineered stone and granite bench tops. So for those that aren't aware, engineered stone is made of almost 100% uh, crystalline silica or quartz, and it's bound together with a resin to make the, the slab of stone. The crystalline silica or quartz can cause uh, silicosis, so that's scarring of the lung tissue, and this can lead to significant health problems, including death. Now, in Australia, there has been a number of people who have passed away from accelerated silicosis due to engineered stone benchtop manufacture. As a result, WorkSafe have been doing 
um, an education campaign for uh, businesses that manufacture engineered stone bench tops in New Zealand. And so we have been getting a, a number of inquiries and doing um, exposure monitoring work for companies that use this product. So the um, engineered stone comes in as slabs and is cut to size uh, by machinery. It can be manual cutting or it could be um, CNC uh, machines, for example. And then it is finished, polished, cut to um, the sink uh, holes cut out and that kind of thing before it is installed on site. So this uh, workplace heard what WorkSafe was saying in, re in relation to this hazard. So they engage an occupational hygienist to help them assess their level of risk. First of all, we undertook a qualitative assessment to identify all the hazards on site. So not only did we identify crystalline silica, but also respirable dust, noise and vibration. We also looked at their similar exposure groups and identified that they had two uh, similar exposure groups. That was factory workers, so that's the workers that uh, cut the bench tops to size and finish them ready for installation. And then they had uh, three on-site installers who would take those finished slabs out to people's homes and install them in their kitchens and make sure they um, the, the sinkholes and that sort of thing are the right, right size and shape. So we undertook some exposure monitoring. And we did the exposure monitoring based on a methodology called EN689. And that is an internationally recognized standard for undertaking exposure monitoring assessments for airborne substances. So what we did is we did uh, six samples for the factory workers and by collecting not just one, but six samples, that enables us to be able to do statistical analysis on the results that we get. So we can have a higher level of confidence on whether the a health risk is being controlled or not being controlled. Because of the variation that you can get in, in daily exposures, one sample just simply isn't enough. You need to do multiple samples to increase your confidence that you are, analyze, that you are assessing the, the health risk correctly. If you take just one sample and you get it on a high day, you might be overcalling the hazard. If you take one sample and you get it on a really low day, you might be undercalling that health hazard. And that has ramifications um, both ways. So it's important that we get a really good understanding of those uh, concentrations experienced on site. Now for the installers, where there's only three people there, we collected three samples for those installers. Now EN689 lets us collect a minimum of three samples per similar exposure group, but it just has a lower threshold for determining compliance. For three samples, all of them need to be below 10% of the exposure standard to be deemed compliant. Whereas for six samples, we can go to a statistical analysis, which gives us a higher threshold for determining compliance. So we looked at a respirable dust um, and re respirable crystalline silica for the factory workers and the installers. We also did a separate assessment for noise and vibration using different standards. And the results for the respirable dust, noise and vibration show that the risks were effectively being managed for those hazards. The results were below the guidelines for vibration and that there was noise present, which was being adequately controlled using hearing protection. And we also gave some examples on how to further reduce noise using uh, controls further up the hierarchy as well. But for now, I just wanna focus on the respirable crystalline silica results. And here they are. So we can see for our installers that we had um, less, all of them were less than 10% of the workplace exposure standard. So that means that for our installers, they are deemed to be compliant with the workplace exposure standards. 
and the hazard is being effectively managed. But you can see for our factory workers that we had almost all of them exceed the workplace exposure standards. So that shows us that further control is needed for those factory workers. And it needs to be undertaken, that those controls need to be implemented straight away. So this is what we recommended that the workplace do. We, also, we of course looked at elimination. Can they stop using engineered stone and just use granite? as granite has far less crystalline silica content, but it's also a more expensive product for the end user. So it was something that we needed to mention to the, to the customer for them to consider, but it may not be practicable for them to do that. We also, uh, the, during, well, for this workplace, they were using a lot of manual wet cutting, um, which means that the person, the operator is close to that process because they're holding the wet cutting tool. So we suggested that they use a CNC uh, to cut the this, this slabs um, to size and to also cut the uh, sinkholes and tap holes in them. Now we recognize that this is an expensive piece of machinery, but it was also quite high up the hierarchy because we're using an isolation and an engineering control to reduce exposure. We also said that no more dry cutting and polishing. There was small amounts of dry cutting being undertaken and small amounts of dry polishing being undertaken also. So we said, let's not do that. Let's just use wet techniques for those um, to eliminate dry cutting from the factory. We also noticed that there was a lot of wet cutting slurry uh, on, on the floor and, uh, on, and on the surfaces with, throughout the factory. So we suggested that they do frequent cleaning on site to get those background levels down and that they get that wet slurry removed using a closed pump system. Now, when we were doing the monitoring, the, these workers were using respiratory protection. They were using a half-face respirator with P2 cartridges. But what we noticed on site was that there was a number of people with facial hair that were still using these respirators. Facial hair and negative pressure respirators are a no-no. You're just going to get dust coming through the respirator. They also didn't have a respiratory protection program in place, or RPP. And by doing so, by formalizing the use of their respiratory protective equipment, they'll get a much better outcome on the effectiveness of that control. So that needs to include a medical evaluation before uh, respiratory protection is issued, ongoing health monitoring, uh, fit testing, medical, um, so medical evaluation, and also cartridge change schedules, because they weren't changing the cartridges very often at all. Training on how to use and maintain the respirator is also really critical when it comes to RPE. And that's why RPE is down on the lowest level of the hierarchy, because it relies on people to do all of the things right while they are donning and doffing or putting on, taking off their RPE, and to make sure that the right cartridges are used, that the respirator hasn't perished. So having that, a really robust system in place is key for that type of control. PPE is not an easy fix. They also needed to implement that health monitoring program and we recommended that they contact the occupational health professional to assist them with that. But they need to start thinking about uh, lung function uh, testing and, just, and other testing that is deemed appropriate by their occupational health professional. So 12 months went by and we were brought in to reassess um, the exposure, which is exactly the right way to do it. Doesn't need to be 12 months, but when you put controls in place, you need to make sure that you measure the effectiveness of that control. So we undertook repeat monitoring for those factory workers. And as you can see, the results are dramatically different. They're 10 times less uh, for some than they were previously 
all of them are below the exposure standards, but we've still got some that I've highlighted in orange that are above 50% of that workplace exposure standard. So we need to still look at control to reduce those levels further. This is a great start, but we still need to look at other things that they can do to further reduce those levels. Workplace exposure standards for crystalline silica are very low because of the drastic health effects that that substance can have on people. So it's not easy to achieve, but it's important that we keep trying to get down to well below that level. And there are things that they can still do. So this um, company, they installed a CNC router, they stopped all that dry cutting. Um, they, what else did we suggest? Oh, yeah, they, um, they looked at their wet cutting slurry and they removed that uh, much better. There's still some um, background levels of dust present, but they are making headway and, and getting rid of as much of that as possible. They're still using RPE for some processes, which is important, but everyone there is clean shaven and using their respirators properly. So I also just want to talk about repeating exposure monitoring, because remember, this is a cycle of continuous improvement. It doesn't stop once you've done that exposure monitoring once. You need to implement controls and re-monitor to check effectiveness. You also need to uh, reassess hazards that show that the control is being effectively managed. Just like uh, safety hazards, you need to keep checking, auditing, uh, making sure that the controls in place are working properly, and just make sure that the your know, levels haven't um, increased due to maybe an increase in production or something like that. So you also need to keep continue to consider new hazards and processes that are brought on site. Or similarly, if you remove a process, um, make sure that you consider that in your exposure monitoring plan as well. Now we are often brought in at the evaluation stage um, and we do a bit of uh, recognition to, to undertake that. This can lead to um, the wrong substances being assessed or substances being missed. So it is better if you bring us in or um, at, at, the, at the anticipation and recognition phases or you yourself have a robust internal process to be able to assess those. Right, we do have some resources available here um, that I want to just quickly touch on because there's some really good information out there. Um, WorkSafe have got some uh, really good information on exposure monitoring and health monitoring as well. NZOHS have recently launched the Breathe Freely website, which is aimed at reducing dust disease in New Zealand. Breathe Freely is an initiative developed by the British Occupational Hygiene Society and adopted by the Australian uh, Industrial uh, Hygiene Society as well. And it's something that New Zealand, uh, New Zealand Occupational Hygiene Society and WorkSafe have partnered on to bring um, to, to New Zealand. It's aimed at health and safety managers and people that uh, need pre that practical advice for their, uh, for their team. So please have a look at that. It covers uh, mining, welding, to the construction sector, um, and engineered stone bench tops as well. But there's just some really good practical advice for how to reduce your dust hazards there. Uh, for, to find a list of occupational hygienists, please go to the NZOHS website. And of course, um, get familiar with the, the health and safety regulations. We've got uh, GRIM, General Risk and Workplace Management, and HAZWAR as well. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all. I'll have a look and see if there are any questions. So I'll just stop sharing my screen for now. Okay, so I don't see any questions there. Um, please feel free to put some questions on there. Um, otherwise, I'll let you all get on with your day. Thank you very much.